Now, how do I get it so I can see the speakers and lots of stuff coming up? Put your card in more. So there, uh, and discussion. When, you double, when you double tap on that, it makes this go large. And then okay. So that, but that'll tell me who's yep, who's welcome, wanting to talk and that sort of thing. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you very much. Um, I'll declare this uh, Tuesday, the fourth of July, <coughs> excuse me, two thousand seventeen, meeting of the finance committee open. Um, just like to welcome everyone and welcome all our thousands of American viewers and wish them well on Independence Day, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To all our thousands of American viewers, the right to smoke out bad guys. <laughs> okay, punk, make my day. Okay, um, we'll, uh, I have three apologies one from uh, Philip uh, and two, and Martin is here, beg your pardon. So now just James for lateness. I'll move. Uh, Mark Bunting, those for, those against, carried, thank you. Um, confirm the agenda. Thank you. Now there is a change, a late change to the agenda. If you'd like to go to page 16, there is a uh, graph there, paragraph 44. I'll give you the... <coughs> So if everyone can, okay, there's a, a graph there, uh, not a graph, a, um, a table. If you look under Rotokauri growth, if you can see that headline, the second item is Rotokauri stormwater infrastructure stage one. If everyone's up, everyone up to date with that? Okay, go across to the um, far right column. Uh, the figure the, in your uh, written agenda, the, the agendas you got would have been 13,239. These, these are all in thousands of dollars. That amount should be 6,834. So a reduction of 6,405. Yeah, I just said, uh, said they're all times. Yeah. The actual figures here are that, that, but put three zeros after everything I say. Um, so what we've got with that will impact down the bottom. So the subtotal uh, for rotocary growth drops by the same amount, by 640. So I haven't done that calculation. But that would drop that from 49,000 to about 43,000. Uh, 43, Will it be what, sorry? 43. Oh. 43491, yeah. Okay. Okay, those, and then the other, the, the grand total, bottom right is currently 67,810, is now 61,406. So that's a late adjustment to our agenda. Okay, given those, that, that change. I'd like to move, uh, confirm the agenda. Uh, Mallet, those in favour. Bunting, those in favour. Thank you. Carried. Are there any declarations of, in, uh, of interest? Have no declaration of interest. Thank you. Uh, any public uh, speakers? No one for the public finance. So we'll move straight on to item number five, page five. No, it's not page five. Page seven, this is, the numbers are wrong here. Okay, page seven, uh, which is the finance, the minutes of the finance committee meeting, 23 May. Just one, <clears throat> one correction, page 10, item 12, paragraph 12. I am a huge advocate for the cars. Resolved Cars Mallet Carson. That should be Councillors Mallet Carson. I don't know if that was a Freudian slip or what it was, but well done, staff. Just you. <laughs> who, who can remember that band in the um, 70s, the Cars? They were great, weren't they? Still listen. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, are there any other uh, question, uh, any other uh, concerns about the minutes? All right. I'll move. A seconder. Uh, Jeff Taylor. Those in favour. Those against. Carried. Okay. F first item on the agenda is the ten-year monitoring report, which is page twelve. Thank you. Okay. Tracy, welcome. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> uh, so today I'm presenting to you the 10-year monitoring uh, report is at the end of May 2017, which is on your page 12 of your agenda. So Council is again showing favourable operating results against budget. Our year-to-date surplus has moved to $44.5 million year-to-date, which is $34.1 million favourable to budget. This favourable variance continues to be due to the unrealised gains from interest rate swaps, our vested assets revenue and revenue associated with our capital projects. Uh, Council's balancing the book measure has increased to a surplus of $15.6 million year to date and this is $13 million favourable to our year to date budget. There have been four new items added to the risk and opportunity schedule which is on page 18. Uh, these are the additional payment um, made back in September to the Kurawai family, uh, the Dominion play Park Playground Security, um, and expenditure related to the river slips and the Water World Capital item. Um, and just in the emerging issue, emerging issue section, we have an acknowledgement of the $2.76 million for the Eastern Bulk Water Main, which was approved last month, but that will be spent over the next two financial years. Council's total overall debt is at the end of May 2017 was $348.8 million, which is $55.3 million less than our year-to-date target. Our 12-month rolling debt to revenue ratio is now currently sitting at 164%. Uh, this lower than budget debt position is due to our lower opening debt position. This year's favourable operating results and of the impact of our deferred capital projects. As at the 31st of May, Council was fully compliant with all of our Treasury policy measures that we have. In terms of capital expenditure, the total spend for our 11 months was $70.5 million. This is $11.9 million behind our year-to-date budget of 82.4. However, $7.2 million of this variance relates to projects that have been proposed for deferral. Management have identified 30 projects with a value of $21.9 million that have potential to not be fully completed by the end of June 2017. Um, and as per the table on point 44, which you've just all been through, um, we can see there that we have some due to reliance on third party, 5.8 under contract, um, and then the rest is um, for other reasons such as um, changes in our priority or seismic waiting for seismic results. Um, as requested last month, we also included in that table what we've spent on those projects so far and what the annual budget is. Um, and just a, a last note on point 38, and, um, uh, the proof brought forward, it should be 5.1, not 5.3. Um, sorry, I didn't... Page 15. So just that very last one, it says 5.3, that actually should say 5.1. So I'm happy to take any further questions. <coughs> okay, Paula, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one question really around the um, projects potentially not going to be completed and deferral because we've got this I mean, if this went out without proper explanation, everything in the garden looks rosy. It looks like we've done great, great work here in trimming our costs. But the true story, isn't it, is that there are quite a few really big projects that will have to either be done within this year or otherwise moved out, but they'll still have to be done, right? I just noticed on page 16, for example, under community projects, and I'm involved in conversations about most of our key facilities quite regularly, so I'm aware of that and bring them to, our, to my committee. But there's quite a lot sitting there around the pool. Uh, we know we've got the library. We've got a lot of things that are, um, coming. So we could potentially create a little um, bow wave of 
I mean, so that this is a point in time position, isn't it, really? Because as those things get spent, it's not going to look as all wonderful. It's not going to look heinous, but it's not going to look as all wonderful as it is right now. And we should be mindful of that. And when we're talking with the public about where we actually are, right? Do you think? Yes, um, it, it is, and it's, I mean, a lot of it is obviously out of our control um, as well. So it, we're not certainly not saying that we're not doing these projects. Um, it's just that for various reasons they're just being um, delayed. And don't forget, this happens every single year. So we're also doing projects this year that for some reason got delayed from last year, and it literally just carries on um, going yeah. forward. And we do take that into consideration when we are reviewing um, when we did the annual plan review and looked at the projects that we were um, doing in that. So we sort of look at it more as a programme of work yeah. um, across sort of, you know, two or three years rather than looking at individual projects as well. So, um, and that's also why we um, sometimes we look at bringing projects forward um, if we can to do those ones instead, um, just because that might be easier all the time and works better for them. No, so. and I agree with all that, so thank you. But I guess when we report the um, uh, debt to <coughs> revenue ratio, and it looks so favourable, what we've got to remind the public, is surely we've got to, my question is, shouldn't we all in our uh, press releases around this not just focus on the one thing but the complexity of it? Because yes. I do know that um, that um, you'll be having a report on, water, uh, report on Waterworld on the briefing this week, <coughs> and um, I've got some indications in the library as well, so, you know, what you save could soon, what you seem to have saved, just temporarily, is soon to be spent, is what? Uh, right? That is correct, yes. Um, just that's a really good point, and a number of us around the table have brought that up a number of times, Tracy. And we've, and it's a it's 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 more a clarity disclosure type issue. Well, it's that, that's one of the issues because Paul is absolutely right. Things look tickety boo in terms of debt to ratio, revenue ratios and our, our budgeted debt, and yet we know we've got this thing we're calling capital projects carryover, which is quote unquote a promise or a liability which we're not showing on our books. So we've collected cash from people, um, we haven't done the work, and yet we aren't showing um, that liability in our books. Well, we are, and, and I do take that into consideration when we are setting the, the annual plan for next year. So um, obviously one of the things that we've taken note of is the fact of, of obviously operationally we're further ahead as well from a debt perspective. So setting the budget for the following year um, takes all of those, um, that, you know, various, um, there's you know, obviously quite a few items, but takes that all into consideration when we're, when we're setting the budget and looking at what we're going to do in the following year. So the way we do it at the moment is by, um, we have a notional negative uh, capital project. No, I, I knew at the time when I was setting the yeah. budgets how much deferral was potentially up, um, would be considered, I think it was about $20 million. So we've taken that into consideration when I've set the debt levels and the debt budget um, and finance costs, because that's mm. how I got some of the finance extra costs for the million dollars at the very last um, meeting that we had. That's how that all came into, into consideration. Okay, so we what we're doing is we are, um, to the extent these projects haven't been delivered as per we expected, we are not delivering the level of service. And I'm, I know it's not, you're, the, you're, you're just the messenger, I totally appreciate that. Yeah, to thanks. the extent we have um, under-delivered under on these projects, um, we are not delivering the level of service we promised or you know, consulted with our residents about. Um, and we're understating our, not understating our debt, because it is our actual, you know, the, the debt is not understated, but there is a big notional, uh, there's a whole lot of work out there that has to be done. Mm. So just can I just clarify that my point wasn't quite quite there in the sense I know that it's there, it's recorded, but when the message goes out to the public, all they do is go straight to the big big financial um, outcome. They'll go to the, mm. and they won't realise that, you know, mm. they shouldn't be too complacent about that yeah. because that work's got to be done and we've all mm. agreed it's got to be done and potentially we're going to spend a bit more money, so... And we do it ourselves by reporting that we are under debt, you know, our, our debt thing's looking great and da-da-da. So we, we just we need to be careful that we don't, you know... Well, it's about uh, transparency for the public talk. rather than, you know... Well, I pretend guess, to ourselves, yeah. If I can help out. <clears throat> I guess that's why when we went through the annual plan presentations, we made sure that um, we disclosed the amount of capex that was going to be pushed forward into the next next year. Um, we don't, we don't defer capital projects um, because we... 
haven't got around to it, so no, to speak. No, no. And you got, and I know you, you all know that. Um, <clears throat> but when when they are deferred, they're deferred for either good reason, good reason in terms of um, needing to know more information about the project before starting that project, or whether there's third party contractual related topics that we um, are working through and those are delayed, or whether it's a third party that just isn't able to um, support us on that project. So. Um, <clears throat> but your point is valid. We need to be open and transparent and make sure the public understand every step of the way um, what is being deferred and um, when that will be done on top of the load um, for the next financial year. That I'd be happy with. Thanks, Paula. Rob? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, thanks Chair. Um, um, just, uh, Tracy, just a follow-on question from, um, um, from the Chair's comments before about the deferred expenditure. Is he correct in saying that we've collected the cash for these projects that we haven't yet spent the money on? He mentioned that you know we've gone out and collected the cash and we haven't delivered um, on those particular projects that have been deferred. Uh, no, because the rates that, <coughs> as I said, the rates that I've set and the budget that I've set for next year, which includes the fact that these will be moved into next year. Okay, so we haven't collected a whole bunch of cash off ratepayers uh, and then not delivered with that level of service that we promised? No, because we are, we're not, not going to do them. We're just saying that we're just not going to do them in this financial year. In this financial year, year yeah. And yeah. some of them would come from debt anyway, wouldn't they? Yes. So, so there would be projects that we don't collect rates for, but we've actually, but that we would borrow for, and we haven't had to borrow for that. At this stage, correct. So yeah, that's okay. why we have favourable okay. finance costs. Can, can I? Say, is there any? There's no development contributions that have been collected for projects. Not for these ones. Okay. No. Okay. So a question around depreciation. Um, in uh, on page 20 on the statement of comprehensive revenue and expense, we've um, under under budgeted for depreciation by about 1.6 million. Um, in the year, in the year to date figures, if I go back to page 18, we have in the risks and opportunities a depreciation increase due to asset revaluations of 2.7 million. I'm just trying to get my yeah. head around whether they one is part of the other or whether they're separate, um, because when I read further, I see that. Um, I see that we're potentially about eight million behind in our estimate. Have I, have I got that right? Eight yes. million dollars behind in our estimate of depreciation. So I'm just trying to get my head sure. around whether they're all an accumulation of the same thing or whether they're all separate. No, it's the same thing. So what we what we'd kind of identified earlier on in the year when I put that 2.7 million dollars in the risk and opportunities, well, I already knew then that mm -hmm. I was going to exceed the depreciation budget by the time I got to June. I estimated and forecasted that to be about 2.7 million dollars. At the moment, that's at about 1.6. Okay. However, I'm I'm just in the middle of loading um, and <coughs> excuse me, finishing off um, the rest of our capitalising our WIP and I'm doing the building and land valuation. In fact, they're doing it right now. Um, and I don't know what that number is. Um, so hence why I didn't kind of, I guess I could have lowered the 2.7 to be a bit closer to the 1.6, but I still have no idea what that outcome is. So okay. it was more of a heads up to say that number there, the 1.6 will be a large number. Yep. Um, yep. And you know, we sort of estimated it, at, you know, when at the beginning of the year to be 2.7. Seven. Um, yep. Hopefully, it'll come in a little bit under that, but it is one and the same thing. Okay. Okay. So, so with the with the whip that's being capitalised at the moment, mm -hmm. um, and some revaluations that are coming through, do you think you'll get to that 2.7 million, or do you think it may, given we've only got one more month um, in okay. the uh, in the year to date figures, it may perhaps land at less than 2.7 million? I don't think I will get to the 2.7. Um, from what, the, what I've seen from the valuations, they haven't actually gone up as much as we thought that they would, but mm -hmm. I've only seen a first draft cut, so um, I would hope it would be a lot less than the 2.7. OK, OK. Uh, Sorry? A work in progress. Oh, sorry, so it's our capital it's work, work in progress. In, yeah, work so in it's progress. all of our projects that then go onto the fixed asset register that then obviously um, start um, having depreciation calculated on them. Not yeah. the sort of whip you're used to, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> OK, thanks. Um, look, question, um, question on, on page 21, which is the local government uh, regulations uh, measure for balancing books. Mm -hmm. And I note that uh, year to date, 
we've got a deficit of about $41,000, <coughs> which means that we're pretty close to break even for the 11 months. Any prediction as to how the last month landed and where the local government measure is likely to be in terms of year end? No, because unfortunately we're right smack bang in the middle of it. So I did ask that question myself yesterday to see if I could get an indication. Yep. Um, but we're still processing, literally still processing June invoices and we don't, we don't cut off until Friday. So, And remember we do have a lot of extra provisions for like landfill and things like that that um, only are only um, year -end done adjustment. uh, year end adjustments. Okay. Um, again, I'm not um, envisaging them to be large like um, they were last year, um, but those are all the extra sort of things that end up coming and hitting us um, for uh, for the end of the year for the June results. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're not expecting any catastrophic event <laughs> that will that will turn that forty one thousand into four million or some other figure that uh, will be significantly different. From what I asked yesterday, no, I'm not. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks for that. Just just looking at um, uh, last week, um, David sent to us an opening statement position um, of the three measures. One, the accounting result to the balancing, the council's um, method for balancing books and the local government. And um, the local government one starts off with a <coughs> negative balance of seven and a half million, seven, <coughs> five, uh, seven million five hundred and seventy two thousand. Excuse me, Rob, are yep. you talking to an item in the agenda? Uh, no, I'm talking to this report that we got last week. Okay. Do you, um, uh, that, it, uh, and that's, cr that's great, except yep. um, I just, other members will be um, okay, well, unaware of what I'll, you're talking about. I'll keep about. my question quite simple and straightforward okay. if I can. I'm just looking for where that figure is in, in here um, because the um, annual budget suggested that it was, about, it was going to be about $8 million. Um, so I'm just wondering, if, is there a reconciliation back to that 7.5 or has the balance significantly moved from that opening position um, that was in this report of last week to what we've actually got in the actual results. Sure. So you have to remember the balancing the books is the P&L. So it's, yep. it, it's, it happens and it's only for um, this year. So it starts all over again. So what you're looking at here will finish and then we'll, we'll start again with a new budget and obviously new measures coming through. It just happens to be coincidence that the number that we were starting off with um, in that particular report mm -hmm. is similar to this number. The one that you've got in front of you was me um, explaining what was in your annual plan report. Yep. So the, your um, your long term plan, what was the starting point for year three in, in, in that particular case, and then what it was doing was explaining all the changes that we had made mm. to then come to the bottom line. So while it looks like it's a similar number, it was actually a whole different reconciliation. So that was me reconciling for you why you were having a different number at the end um, for the $11 million compared to what you'd started off with if you opened up your annual plan and looked yep. at the government's measuring the books number um, in there. Okay. So kind of not related, but... Um, so that 7.5 will change after the 1st of July. So that 7.5 has already changed, and that yep. was what all I was trying uh, to do as part of that. Okay, and it will that. relate to something that ends up in this... Yeah, in, so in this, in this uh, report. Correct. So uh, in the annual budget, you'll yep. see the $11 million number. That's right at the bottom of that reconciliation, which yep. is where we ended up with. That'll be, um, you'll see that next year when we start and we move into the 17-18 yep. okay. year okay. Um, instead of the 8.46. Okay. So it'll be, that, that'll be the number that is okay. there. Okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Now, I just wanted to talk about this measure because um, obviously there's, there's, there appears to be... Um, <coughs> some wish around the council table. Rob, just, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Just to, as a courtesy of other members, are you, you, is there anything in here that they can look at that you're talking to at the yeah, moment? Yeah, I'm talking on page 21, okay. which is, um, I think I, I identified that right at the beginning. Okay. So the, the questions are around page 21, which is the local government <coughs> regulation measure for balancing the books. Yep. And uh, the question that I've got is around the fact that there appears to be... Um, perhaps support around the council table for moving from the method that we previously used, which of course predates the, this measure, uh, towards something which is nationally recognised as the best method. And I'm just wanting to question about the fact that in, in the case of this measure, I know we take out um, 
uh, Rob, development. Can you, when you say this measure, can you say the council's measure no, the, or the, the local government the measure? The local government measure. So everyone yep. knows what yep. you're talking okay. about. Okay. The local so, government measure takes out the development contributions, but it does it because they regard those as a capital rather than a <coughs> revenue item. I'm sh I think I'm correct in assuming correct. that. But they don't take out sub subsidies, which includes a capital subsidy. Do you think, as a, as a chartered accountant, that is an inaccuracy, that, that is an inconsistency with having taken out the DCs because they're a, 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 um, a, capital, a capital revenue that we're leaving in capital <coughs> subsidies? Okay, can, I, can I respond to that? Yeah, um, sure. Um, sure. I, I agree with you, um, Councillor Pascoe. In fact, um, I, uh, even on the 7th of March, and I don't know why I know that date specifically, but the 7th of March when I did my presentation, I noted there that I actually lobbied um, the DIA to improve this measure for exactly those points you're raising. So from an accounting point of view, you're absolutely correct. Um, on the 12th of July, PricewaterhouseCoopers are bringing to the briefing um, their um, review, and I'm going to call it the cost to run the city, but they're also looking at which measures are most appropriate what they've done is they've taken a more um, detailed assessment of what the true measure should be for measuring performance. And it's, uh, for example, if it's a capital revenue and there's no cost associated with that capital revenue within the profit and loss statement, moving it to the balance sheet, they've taken more of a, uh, we, we, what is the source of the revenue and what cost does it relate to approach, which means they've looked at development contributions, which is what this is trying to adjust for, but they've also added back the costs that do sit in the p and And I, I'm having a conversation personally with um, Rob now, because I think from a, only those accountants in the room will get this. They've also adjusted for external capital subsidies as well um, to make sure they've been correctly treated. So they've got a view on that and um, bring that to a briefing. And then on the 29th of July, um, we'll be tabling the final report to council to be put on record as well, which will then um, uh, reflect what they believe is the best measure for measuring <coughs> performance going forward to make sure things are correctly allocated to the right place to make the most sense in terms of a council that's growing and has all these additional revenues mm -hmm. and so forth. So um, I agree with you that this potentially has some limitations, as does, which I've always said, the, the balance book measure that we use has some limitations. Yep. But what I've asked PwC to do is actually develop a measure that doesn't have the limitations, which is actually factually correct and reflects those nuances that I just mentioned. Do you think there's, there's, there's a position that we might land on, a perm, you know, that we might have a permanent landing on this? so that we don't have um, disagreements around this council table between the two balancing oh. the book methods that we use. A absolutely. Uh, because I can see this uh, argument going on forever and a day in terms of which method might suit at a particular time as to which method we might use. And, um, and, um, and there will be constant disagreement around that one, yep. one, one method will, will, will deliver quite a significantly different answer to the other. Yep, Rob, so I'd, sorry to interrupt. I, I just wonder if that's a discussion for the task force it's, it, within the task force, which other members can uh, Can I just outline the process, yep. Chair? Oh, yeah. um, so that should be a discussion for the task force. No, just <laughs> <laughs> um, so the um, task force will be covering that. But that's what I've asked specifically for um, PwC to make a recommendation on as an enduring way of measuring performance for council. Yep. And um, that'll go to the task force. I mean, the report's coming back to council because the task force has already seen the report. Um, it hasn't changed significantly from what they put through, to the, through on that report. They've just tidied up how they communicated it. Um, but the task force's role is to make a recommendation to council yep. about a, a measure of performance going forward for measuring um, council's financial viability or living within its means or however you want to describe it, um, yep. okay. Mr Councillor. Yep. Okay. And you might even have some influence on that task force, don't you? Oh, well, who knows? I, uh, I, know, I know the chair personally. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's been there's been comment there's been comment around the, the table about the fact that we're living beyond that this council is living <laughs> beyond its means in terms of its present financial strategy to the extent of around four million dollars. Can you find in this statement on page twenty one where that four million dollars is? No. No. Okay. Okay. Um, I'd be interested to know if that if, if that four million dollars. Is, is capable of some calculation. But um, obviously at this stage, um, you're quite happy that this report fairly reflects that pretty close to 41,000, certainly for the 11 months we are living within our means. Correct. Yep. Okay. And just one last question. And is living within our means and accounting Defined well, no, it's, it's something though that people understand, Gary, yeah, yeah. you know, that, um, you know, does our revenue, uh, mm. is our revenue sufficiently 
sufficient to cover our expenses, and I think that's what I really mean yeah. by living within our means. And just one, one other comment, that one other question, because um, it is question time, and that's around our arts and, I've just lost my place in here now, our arts uh, and um, expense. I heard coming, arts and culture, I heard coming in on the radio this morning a, a news item about the deterioration of artworks that are held by Hutt City Council. And the reasons given is that they have not in the past few years provided for adequate maintenance. Um, I know in the last uh, discussion we had about the sculptures, um, I did question um, staff about um, adequacy of maintenance for our statues and, and sculptures, and as well as the artworks. Um, uh, can I ask a question? Are, are we reasonably confident that we have got sufficient funds in our budget to meet these maintenance costs so we don't end up, as Hutt City appears to have ended up with, a number of significantly valuable artworks that now require um, uh, huge costs spent on um, bringing those back to a, an appropriate standard? Uh, at the moment, yes, um, but as Nick Johnson said the other day, as the portfolio grows, then we would have to um, increase uh, our operating costs um, uh, commensurate with the um, uh, the amount of artwork that increases. So um, we're proposing on the LTP some small increases. It's not it's not hundreds of thousands of dollars or anything like that. It's um, probably more in the, the tens of thousands over over time. So it's um, in in the scheme of things, it's probably you know reasonably um, modest. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Angela. Thanks, Chair. Can I just follow up uh, Councillor Pascoe's question to the CE? Just on that, uh, the measures, at the, and I'm on that uh, revenue and finance task force, strategy task force, we are still to have that conversation around the rationale and the reasons behind each measure and which measure that we land on and which measure the task force does actually put their support behind, because I support what Councillor Pascoe is saying. Yes. So that's all happening before the briefing. That, that's, I was actually just thumbing through my phone trying to find out when the next task force meeting is. The goal is to have the task force. Um, I only added it to the briefing um, schedule um, last, late last week um, because there was a request by a councillor that we bring it back through a briefing process that was the only briefing that's available. Now I'm running to catch up and make sure the task force is happening before then as well. So. With a little bit of um, flexibility in your diaries, hopefully we can schedule that to make sure that happens. Okay, because I think that, well, I know that that will be quite a, a meaty discussion because yep, it's critical to our planning for the next 10 years. Yes, that, that's you. correct, Councillor. Okay, thank you for confirming that. Um, Tracy, thank you for including on page 16, including that additional information. I know that that was something that I requested last uh, at the last meeting and that's helped follow through um, all of the figures. Now, i just wanting a little bit more transparency in your written report as well, if I could, around the uh, additional indicative capital um, expenditure deferral programs, because um, while you've counted them up and said there's 30, there is actually seven new ones reporting from last report, so I think it's important that we're more transparent around that. Two have dropped off because the two uh, pots of money from Claudelands, which were around 500,000, I think, at the last meeting we put back in the bucket. Um, so I'm just wondering if through your uh, commentary report that you can highlight that a little bit more. Um, just a small item on that page, so I'm still under the capital deferrals uh, list under 44, right down, almost right down the bottom, under community projects, the museum asset renewal has gone up 50,000. Is that supposed to be in there? Or is that for, for the next financial year? Because it's 50,000 each year that we have to put forward, isn't it, for museum purchases, uh, for artwork purchases. And that was 17,000 at last report, and it's I'm sorry, it's just a nominal amount, but I'm just wondering if that was an error. Uh, I'm not sure. I'll just stop. I'll, I'll have to come back to you on that. So okay. 
Maybe I'll look into it and come okay. back later it, in the meeting. It feels like, yeah, just, it looked to me on first glance like that was the next year's 50,000 popped in there early. Um, and thanks for that extra page. I'm on page 18, under risks and opportunities. <coughs> uh, just clarify, on the Eastern Bulk Water Main, and these are, this is under the list of approved by Council Committee Resolution, it's got there the 11th of April. Um, I thought we made that decision through Council, not we highlighted it through the last finance meeting, but we actually, I, I'm pretty sure we made that decision through uh, the 6th of April council meeting. So, I mean, small, really small thing, but when we're putting a list in, and if we need to look back on council resolutions, we, we need to be correct about that. So you might want to check that. And it's 1.87 million. Um, and the last- Just give us a reference on that. I'm on the same line. Oh, okay. I'm on the same page, the same. The Eastern Bulk Water Main. Um, I thought it was that we approved 1.08 million. Do you? Is that too difficult? To, you maybe just come back to me on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll leave that question open then. And. I'm just on page 22, the big sheets. You mention, in, right at the top there, number one on rates, and I'm talking about the uh, rates remission that we offer to the public. You've got there that there's a table below, but I couldn't find the table. I'm assuming the table has more So there's a table on the bottom of page 23? On the back of that page. Oh, right. Here. Okay. Okay. I, I've seen that information. Okay. Just a few questions just on that, um, Tracy. The, so we're now looking at page... Uh, so so we're, back, we're still on page 22 on rates, and this is the underspend and the uh, rate. Okay. The, because the cost of... People aren't picking up our rebate. Um, I just want to... To clarify, we have, and you, I sent you an email the other day, and you responded. We have a two. We have two budgets for rates remissions that members of the public can apply for. One is the government scheme. Is that right? And how much is that one? Uh, we don't differentiate between the two. Right. Okay. <coughs> okay. So we have three hundred and sixty-nine thousand. That was the budget for this year, and that's pretty much the same each year. Uh, right? It was similar to the year before, however, okay. my understanding was it was lower the year before that, but it had been increased um, okay. under the last council. Okay, so we have 369,000 annual budget for ratepayers to apply for the two schemes. One is the government that we give out from the government, and that's people, ratepayers can apply up to $610. Correct. And, the, and then the second one on top of that is one that we've put money into the pot for, and that's the hardship one in extreme circumstances, and that's another $410. Correct. So I'm not sure where, um, Mr Chair, to pick this up, but this concerns me that we're constantly underspent. <coughs> Plus also in this report, we are reporting that we are issuing more penalty notices um, because and, and so I, I'm wondering if there's a if there's a relationship there be, between the fact that people don't know that we can offer assistance for low income earners. So I'm not sure whether that's I can raise that. I want something done about that. Whether that's a comms plan, whether that's understanding what we do, whether it's come, perhaps it's coming to a briefing. Um, advice, Angela, it, it could could be more than just the comms. It could be that the well, yes, uh, could be. qualification, you know, the the conditions for getting it are too high. So people may be applying for it and not not being oh, accepted. So I just I, want I to like, delve like into it a little bit, but I like Councillor Lee Angela's suggestion. I think we'll bring it through to a briefing. So we'll do a bit of analysis, bring some data through, look at what's happening, what the um, breakdown of that looks like, um, and and also bring forward some 
potential strategies to address that, and yep. then go okay. and get your views, and then we can lock and load that. Because I think I could probably do most things that you need within my delegation, not having to bring that back to councillor, but I'm really keen to hear councillor's views on it. Yeah, I think an informal conversation would be really helpful, because I did pop onto the website to try and find it, and it was very, very difficult to try and access that information. So thank you for that, CE. Um, appreciate that. Just on page 54, and thanks, you've got, it's a little bit difficult going backwards and forwards to the notes all the time, but I'm on uh, halfway down under economic development, and these are the capital expenditure for the year, uh, for the 11 months. And under Claude Lins and Stadia, so perhaps Sean will answer this one, we're underspent so far by a million dollars, and I'm and I understand, and this was where perhaps, Tracy, you could amend the reports. It was I had to keep going backwards and forwards to find out actually what projects were deferred and what weren't. It was hard to track, but... So the notes on the flick's got a number on the side that normally yeah, tells you it's deferred. Yeah, I know, but you're deferred. going backwards and forwards all the time. It's Given that it's an A3 piece of paper, I'm just wondering for practical use of it whether we could put all the information on the same page. But if you take out the deferred projects that you're indicating, are we going to complete that budget for the Claude and Stadia? Are we going to spend it? Because it's a million dollars underspent. Uh, yes, so I'll just answer through the chair. Yes, we should do. It's a bit nip and tuck, uh, to be fair. We've got a lot of equipment that actually is, has physically arrived in this, um, or in June, so that we didn't pop it through until the end, especially the um, technical equipment for, a uh, for the stadium, for FMD stadium and so forth. So, yeah, it's pretty close and as I think some of you will have seen the work at Seddon Park has been delayed with rain and so forth, but that once again will, will all be cleared up in June. Okay, great. Thanks, Sean. Sorry, Angela, just on, so, so to be clear, Sean, you're talking about the 296,000, oh, you, you probably have, have you got this in front of you? The 296,000 regarding so the Seddon Park, are you talking about Seddon Park? 296 FMG and... S yep. Okay, and the Seddon Park one, where's the Seddon Park one? The uh, just down um, below... Um, that's overspent, isn't it? Oh, sorry, that's Seddon Park... Oh, no, sorry, um, okay. uh, that's the Stadia Building Renewals. Oh, sorry, oh, there's, there's another... Seddon Park is within that. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Angela. And that's, it. that's my questions, thank you. Thanks, Angela. Uh, Siggy. And Mr Chair. Okay, I've got all over the place. I'll get there. Um, the first one was on page um, 18. I just saw um, with the Dominion Park playground, the, the security cost. Um, is that going to be an ongoing yearly cost from now on? No, we've, we've taken the security away and um, things are okay. Okay. So okay. it was just for an initial um, during the um, after the opening, just to make sure that the asset was uh, kept safe. But um, we've been working with the community, and um, I'm glad to say that we've got a lot of community people um, keeping an eye on it and taking ownership, which was the aim for yeah. that um, particular yeah. area. So I think that's a really good outcome. Yeah. Well, that's what I thought that was the aim. So that's why I was a bit surprised to have that <coughs> account that money. But that's all right. Um, on page 22. Are you currently tracking behind, that's water by metre, um, currently tracking behind budget and it's due to lower usage by high use of customers. Um, I just wondered, is that, w what's the reason for that? Why would high use of customers now use less water? Is there if more efficiency, better education? Just wonder. So that was, um, we talked about that last month, so one of the, um, the major contributors towards that is the University of Waikato, so they're obviously doing a project at the moment to use less water, oh, cool. so obviously so that has, a, yeah, has, a, has an effect on us. Yeah, no, so. that's great, that's great. Um, I just want to know because that's something we could, maybe could be rolled out to other areas as well, to edu if they have a great program on educating people on just less water use. They are water by metre, aren't they? So they have a incentive to... Yeah, mm. correct. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. Awesome. Um, okay, next one is... No, I'll do that one. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, I was just coming back to the playground, but that's fine. No, that's all cool. Now, the last one I wanted to ask was on page 60. 60? 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. Um, 
There's, council has purchased additional vehicles for the building inspectors. Um, and I just wondered, are we replacing them with hybrid or electric cars or just normal ones? Um, we're currently working through that, so um, I haven't got an answer for you today, but I'm happy to send, send out a, a note to inform you. Okay. Can we? Uh, can I suggest that it could be replaced with hybrid? That's exactly what councils um, we're working through at the moment. The okay. the challenge for us is the um, total cost of ownership of those cars, and they they um, they are new and exciting. But they cost a lot because there are um, there's a small number that are purchased. As more and more get purchased, the the cost of each unit being produced, if you like, is, goes down, and it becomes um, cost effective for a council to engage in. But we're certainly wanting to support um, energy efficiency, and so that's that's the direction that we're going. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. So just on that, what what is the guiding principle? Um, are we going to do? It's the most efficient and effective way of doing it. Or are we going to um, surrender and just go to the whatever's fashionable? Um, it's it's really um, council's call. Uh, the total cost. So you haven't you're not being you no. haven't got it. We haven't got a no, policy. No, we're working. We're well, working at the moment, through the that. Policy is most efficient and effective. Is it? Is well, it last, last total cost of ownership. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Last total yeah. Cost of and that's what we work from. But um, if there's a desire for council to spend more money on cars to be more sus um, sustainable, um, it's a it's a cost benefit thing. But we're working through it. The prices are coming down, so I don't think it needs to be too much of an ethical question. I think that um, let us get through that, and we'll come back with some information when we've. Um, we've got some, some data for you to make a decision. Jeffrey. Jeff. <laughs> it's, that's better. Thanks, Gary. Can I sound <laughs> like your mum? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my, my question was also about the security with Dominion Park, and um, I, I acknowledge that it's Sorry, a relatively... Sorry, what page is that again, Jeff? Page 18, the Risk and Opportunities Report. I acknowledge that it's a, it's a small uh, figure relatively when you're looking at all the other figures. But I just wondered, um, Lance, what, what conversations were there with the police uh, before we resorted to the security? And what, how helpful were the police? Um, there were conversations with the police. We, we have an <coughs> ongoing dialogue with the police on a number of matters um, in my area and obviously Kelvin Powell with the city safety team. Um, you, you probably know, and it's been discussed at um, uh, other committee meetings over the last wee while around um, uh, resourcing of the police and, and the way they operate. So, um, and community constables and that sort of thing. They they um, did say that they would keep an eye and thing, but obviously, um, you know, they can't drive past there all the time and that sort of thing. So there were conversations, um, but. Um, I make a call uh, as the GM on uh, particular areas. If we have um, particular bad behaviour, then we will put in security guards, whether it's libraries or at the Hamilton Gardens. Um, we have a few hot spots now, and again, um, we don't tend to have security guards everywhere or anything like that. We just tend to do it where needed, and when it's not needed, then we obviously withdraw them. So that's what's happened in this case, and we've um, carried on that dialogue with the local community. Um, my key aim was to make sure that we didn't have, you know, a, a million dollar or so asset um, ended up getting torched within the first three months, which would be no good for anyone. Um, yep. So um, it may sound a bit cautious. Um, we, we had a little bit of tagging and that sort of thing, but um, generally uh, with our staff, the community and our security guard, um, then, uh, you know, we felt that we kept a lid on things. Um, there have been a couple of small incidences, mainly behavioural rather than um, damage and that sort of thing, where my understanding is that, uh, you know, the, the police had been called and, and that sort of thing at the park. But that, that's pretty not unusual for any of our parks at times. Um, yep. So, yep. so really just a precautionary um, thing, and then we've, we've reviewed that it, um, as the weather's got, um, you know, a bit, bit grimmer and colder and foggy and stuff like that, the, um, uh, that, that behaviour tends to um, tail off somewhat. But I think um, as people have taken ownership of that, that park, which is really good, then I think uh, um, you get the, the self-policing from the local community. And um, to be honest, they quite often know who have done things and, and people know what's going on in the local community and that sort of thing. And so I think um, you get a bit of that peer pressure coming in around that. 
Right. I, I guess that was actually partly my point in the that you know, there used to be, uh, I don't know if there's still a very good community constable in the West, and uh, it just seems those relationships possibly aren't there between the police and the, and the community as they used to be. I wonder if we should perhaps on charge the 65,000 to the police for doing their job for them. Um, the other question I had was just to what degree will this um, impact on, on our policy for locating things like this in, in areas like Norton? Um, I don't necessarily mean not putting them there, but are we in a position where we can perhaps build relationships with local people before it happens, or did we try to do this this time, you know, to develop a network to actually keep an eye out before it even happens? I don't know. Yeah, we do. We Obviously, we have our community advisors who, um, you know, work with... Uh, local community houses and other other groups um, and choosing where the playgrounds go um, uh, obviously you know we've got to take into account what's happening in particular neighborhoods but at the end of the day I think um, uh, we're going to make sure that we we don't get influenced by the the small minority and actually um, don't have facilities in places where you know the vast majority will get benefit from them yeah, so I think, yeah no, I agree with that yeah, yeah. so um, I, you know, so our staff and, and um, the Parks and Open Spaces team, obviously with the community advisors, you know, we try and work with as many people as possible. And obviously some of the partnership things we're doing with schools, then obviously schools, you know, have, you know, major fingers into the whole community through children and parents and grandparents and that sort of thing. So um, we try and build that network um, uh, as much as we can um, before we do projects and, and that sort of thing. I think it is, I think you're right, it's about having those conversations <coughs> early and I think we... Um, I think we've got better at that, and um, you know we have learnt from other councils who have been in similar situations. Um, I remember some years ago, Manukau City Council, um, before the amalgamation in Auckland, had a number of playgrounds that were getting trashed, and they really did a lot of work with local communities to um, get that self-responsibility from the community, and they were quite successful in doing that. But it does take some effort, but I think um, in the long run you get the payoff from it. Thanks, Lance. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Mark? It was a really cool conversation. Thank you for that. Um, just want to, David, I just want to put you back on the hook. Um, that uh, dialogue you're having, all the research you're doing into with electric cars and the likes, um, what form is that taking and when will we see that reporting? How often will we see that reporting? The, the reason I ask is that I remember when Gary and I started on Welltrust, solar was like this wild dream and now... Obviously, it's become more cost effective. So, I'd be really keen to see what sort of monitoring is done on that. So sure. It, it, I wouldn't say it's cost effective. I'd say that it's, the prices are coming down. Um, right, yeah. you know, the price of an electric car is double what you could buy for a normal petrol based car at the present. Mm. So, that's our challenge. We work closely with um, government agencies and also the LAS, um, LAS Fleet Working Group. So, that's a local authority shared services group. Mm -hmm. um, and we have also have a contract with um, Fleet Smart, which are our fleet providers. So we're, we're, I suppose it's a regular agenda item when we catch up to talk about where yep. the status of those um, vehicles are. Um, quite, quite plainly, at double the price of a, of a petrol-based vehicle we're, or a diesel-based vehicle, we're, um, we're, not, we're not leaning to um, be throwing a whole lot of money at those cars until the price of it comes down. But in saying that, we're monitoring those prices closely. Yeah, at, at less than half the price to fill it up, obviously, that's cost effective, yeah. isn't it? OK, no, so we will be pretty regularly updated then. Sure, on, on yeah, that. absolutely. Cool. I mean, yeah. as I say, it's, a, it's the intent of Council to support that. Um, in yeah. terms of double the price, it's a, yeah, but it's got it's a challenge. Sense. Yeah, exactly. I appreciate the balance. Thank you. What was that? Yeah, go ahead. conversation to be had strategically about whether we want to go down that road is coming up soon in the LTP discussions and yeah. Yeah. the business we're in. <coughs> yeah, that's good point. If you want to change direction, that's the place to do it. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, just, uh, can I go right back to that deferrals issue? Um, and from a very high level, or perhaps low, some would argue, is there... So you're on 40, uh, paragraph 44 still? That, yeah, just, or just on the general concept table? of deferrals. Okay, yeah. um, it's something that, you know, look, I've, I've seen it in the paper, Council is banging on about it for years. Is it just the nature of the business that we're in that we seem to be uh, not completing a lot of projects? Like, for example, if there was a road that was late, we'd scream blue murder. If we contracted someone to do any sort of service for us, we'd scream blue murder if it was late. Um, and yet this seems to be quite a constant kind of a thing. Is this an area that perhaps the REAP is looking at? 
how we better monitor our deferrals because it seems to be such a big chunky grey area that we can't budget for or we can hide behind or it can be used for political purposes etc. Sorry Mike, did you ask is it something the regular... Yeah, yeah, hang on, get in there. Um, oh, sound like you, <laughs> sorry. Um, no, just yeah, wondering what, wasn't quite clear what your question yeah, was. Yeah, is there a way we can budget for it better? Is there a way we can better monitor it? Because it seems to be quite unique to what we do. Okay, so there's a couple of um, points to what you're kind of saying. So first of all, remember when you're setting the, the long-term plan, you're setting a set of projects and a set of what you're going to be spending on your money for two, um, three to four years in advance. Yeah. So so you have to realise that obviously we're you know, when, when the Chris and, and, and the team are, are sitting down trying to figure out what they're going to do and what projects they want to spend their money on and, and what they're going to do, um, you know, develop or whatever, that that's three or four years in advance of, of when those yeah. things are going to happen. So so we can have the best crystal ball in the world, um, but rain happens, weather events happen, things change, etc., etc. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you've got to got to put, take that into consideration. The other thing that council does specifically is very focused on doing things in a financial year. Um, so rather than looking at it from a, if we gave you a program and said, right, we think over the next three years we're going to um, look at these sort of things, and then we will have individual projects underneath it, mm. rather than getting really honed down on specific projects that for various reasons, and I mean, and Chris and the team and, and various others for whatever, they're trying really hard in the background to make all of this happen, mm. but it really is beyond our control. So, right. um, so that, I mean, yeah, it's it, all of these sort of things. We do not bring deferred projects to the table lightly. Yeah, um, you know, we've done a lot of work in the background. Um, but at the end of the day, the other thing is we're so financially constrained on how it's set up at the moment um, from financial year to financial year um, that we sort of don't want to lose the money either in mm -hmm. the sense that actually, you know, we still want to carry on and finish, finish these projects, which we always do. Yeah. Um, so that's just how it's done. Whether or not that's the right thing to do um, is, uh, again, um, a discussion that should be had as part of the LTP. Well, it's in a very a couple simple of other, A couple of other... Yes, sorry, oh, sorry um, Councillor Bunting. A couple of other comments too. The, <laughs> when we defer a project, doesn't mean to say it hasn't started and also it could yeah, mean that it's going to be July, August, September it finishes. So that's the first point. The second point, which I agree with Tracy, is we shouldn't be bound by the fiscal 12 months for a project when we have programmes of work that span over a three-year period. So yeah. to pick up on her point... Um, we don't want um, a financial year end driving behaviour right. around completing a project to try and get it all done and, and maybe maybe um, not getting the best outcome for council. So one of the things that we're exploring within the leadership team is whether how we how we sort of couch this differently for council. Mm. That is um, take a take a three year approach to projects so that you. Um, get more visibility around the information on projects, but we're just not so constrained or focused on the fact that a financial year is coming up for, yeah, yeah. Um, and therefore um, <coughs> it means a, a really um, a bad thing when it might be just really good program management in terms of utilising the right resources at the right time, yeah. given the copious numbers of um, variables that occur in terms of uh, external parties and contract negotiations, etc. Because the nature of our projects are big, right? And mm -hmm. so the flexibility would help. I, I agree with that. Because bottom line is, are we asking too much of you guys to get all the stuff done within the year and predict it on a dime? So I guess that's that's where I'm coming from with that. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Cool. Sorry if it seemed a bit vague, but yeah. Richard cool. jumped up too. Do you want to... We also allow, from a financial mod modelling point of view, an adjustment within our budgets to reflect the fact that we acknowledge there's going to be some external factors and we back out 10 million? 20, 20, 15. Was, sorry, 15 for next year. I'll back 15, out. 15 million dollars. We sort of say, hey, we're going to do this piece of work. We know it sort of happens <coughs> within a, a period, not necessarily straight within the fiscal period, so therefore we do an adjustment for that. But year on year, our cash flow we spend on our capital is pretty consistent with budget. So, because what we gain, what we lose in terms of getting deferred into the next year, we gain from projects coming from the previous year. Yeah. So it actually swings in roundabouts. Our, our capital spend roughly there, but also, but although for the, the year we're currently in, it does ramp up a lot. So it, we'd expect to see that's why we've increased the amount. We expect to see a, a greater portion um, of projects that may not necessarily be completed at year end, largely due to the fact that it involves third parties and, and, and so forth. Just on that, Richard, though, I mean, you've worked in Fonterra, which does huge capital projects just like the City Council does. This does not happen in Fonterra, does it? 
Um, I'm going to start. Well, not off. not in not in the, well. Actually, Tracy's come I'm, from I'm, there. Is I'm, anyone here who hasn't been at Fontaine? <laughs> um, it's completely um, coincidental. I'm going to start off by acknowledging the fact that Tracy knows more about this than I do. This was her area of expertise at Fonterra. <laughs> So I will hand over to Tracy. Okay. Well, I, I guess, and I, look, this is not a witch hunt, but we, we've had that. You know, I've had this discussion for three years before <laughs> before you came along, um, and it just seems to me we just accept it, and just I, I cannot understand why we can't. And, and, and with Fonterra, you've got this, you've got multiple contractors and multiple phases of projects, and they're massive, multi-hundred million dollar things. Um, Rich is going to have another go as well. <laughs> no, no. I just don't, and, and we all know that there's a winter every year, and that you can't do much during winter. Uh, just what do you think? The difference. And when, the when, when do we get better at it? No. <laughs> but, 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 but when do we? But, but here's the serious part. It, we, yeah, that's all right. Okay, here's the so serious the difference bit. Between a, how, Tracy, how, how, Tracy, when do we get better? The, because we are not getting better, and that's something that really upsets me. You know, as an organisation. You know, sure, we're in the p public sector and we're supposed to be slow and, you know, and unreactive and that sort of stuff, but we're just not getting any better in this thing. I think Tracy's waiting to answer you yeah. <laughs> your, your very short question. Yeah. Um, it is basically um, because you, um, in council, you've decided to be constrained by financial year. Fonterra's not. So when you do the budgets for Fonterra, it is a budget, it is a programme of work, you get your project approved. If it takes, you know, you're imagining where you're, you're building factories, you're mm. building, um, you know, really large um, pieces of things, they can take up anywhere between three to four years to actually um, build those um, particular items. Um, so the capital program is done as a program, it's a program of mm. work, it gets reported on every year around what your spend is within that year um, and forecasts. But how does that like differ that. from what we do? Because because exactly you are what we do. No it's not, because you're very constrained about you have a start and a stop. You start on the 1st of July, you finish on the 30th of June and that is it and you report on that. Yeah. So to change it would be to change it to say um, potentially maybe it's a three year program of work. So over the three years I will report to you on what your plan of work is for the three years, what we've spent and what's remaining. So by default, you, you don't have deferrals anymore because the project could finish, as David just alluded to. For all I know, some of these projects are finishing in two months' time. Mm. Um, but I need that money because mm. otherwise I don't have the budget to spend and carry on spending on those projects in the next financial year because I have to cut off and start again. Can, can I just add on But when we But when we do a project that we know is going to take like the ring right all of those things we know they're not going to count finish in one year so we chop it into we think that much work is going to get done in that year and it, which is exactly what Fonterra would do that much work is going to get done in that year can I, can I, can I pick it up just to be clear on this so, um, so there are a number of differences so firstly at a high level part of the differences with Fonterra or any organization they control their own destiny so they don't have third-party developers building subdivisions based on their economic delivery model and they make a decision that Hey, we're not at this point in time, therefore we don't need council to put their roads through and so forth, so that's beyond their control. What Fonterra doesn't also have going for them is they will do a 10-year capital program, which all organisations do, but as soon as they come to a program to be delivered, they go down and they reassess all their dates <coughs> down to a detailed project level and they report against that detailed project level. We're not reporting here against a detailed project level, we're reporting against a 10-year plan or, a, or an annual plan that was done a number of years earlier. Mm -hmm. and at that stage, we know roughly when we're going to be spending the money, We've, we know exactly what we're going to deliver. When we're going to deliver it, we get closer in time to doing it. And that's why we can predict with some accuracy when we're going to defer a project, because once we do our detailed planning, we know when we're going to deliver against it, and we're very good at delivering against our detailed project plans, but it's too late. The annual plan was adopted a year earlier, and we can't go back and reassess it. So the environment that Fonterra works in is they always strive for the greater granularity of their planning, and they report against that. They, will, they, will, they can split their projects. What, I could ask Chris now to split his projects down to a detailed level across the fiscal year, but it's irrelevant from a reporting against annual plan point of view because that's at such a big, chunky level. So that's the difference with Fonterra. They constantly drive down to a detailed project plan and report against that. So, and having them controlling their own destiny and, and not having third parties, they, they do have contractual issues. Going, I've, I've built, been involved in building factories and you compete with stainless. If you're trying to get stainless, there's a market for stainless. But generally, Fonterra is such a um, uh, dominant, purchaser. dominant purchaser. But they do have lags. Mm. And then they will report that to the board. There was a delay in this project because of uh, the failure to uh, acquire the stainless. Or it's coming from Germany, or it's coming from around the world, and shipping. there's a shipping delay. They do, that does happen. But it's been managed at a, at a micro plan. 
not against a plan that was set three years earlier, which is probably more of a macro plan. And that's where we are. We, we report to you at a macro level, but we manage internally at a micro level, which gives us the granularity. So right now, once we sign off this 10-year plan, when we go through the process in June next year, um, we will have a macro plan. Then these guys start allocating their program work down to a detailed level, and they can probably tell you within six months that given all that work, given the involvement with the developers and so forth, they can probably predict the deferred because they've gone down to that next level of granularity. Okay. So that's the challenge. So, so are you saying that we could do it? We could get more accurate if we we're prepared to spend a bit more effort doing it. Oh, if, you, if, if we had, and if there's a, and if there is some value in doing that. Yeah. So if we had more resource, and we could control, um, and when I say more resource, if we we did all our detailed planning for all our projects up front, right? We could do a, a micro plan, but then we still don't control all of the variables, mm -hmm. whereas Fonterra does. So we don't control when developers are going to complete their subdivision. We don't control. Um, the, the weather, a large part of Fonterra stuff can be built regardless of the weather, um, whereas we have um, um, longer and shorter weather periods for winter and so forth like that. So, but like I say, we know there's going to be a winter, we know there's going to be yep, a summer. A a absolutely, but we talk about here with um, the VATR site the other day, is about the hopes is that winter, you know, it doesn't rain for a period of time, so we can get the contractors in before this date and after this date. So you're starting to talk about, at a detailed level, you know, weather events that actually directly impact on when you can start and stop a project. So. Um, what we're doing here is no different to other local authorities in the country. I agree it's frustrating, and that's why we try to adjust it. Mm. We could, we could, what we could do is we could back, our, back out a whole lot of projects and say, look, we just know that there's going to be some issues, we back them out. Then we're in a position that we haven't rated for them, that means we've got to borrow for them, which means that our borrowing costs are going to be greater than we're going to have to repay. So we try to split the difference by accurately as we can at a macro level, and then at a adjustment 15 million to reflect the fact that, hey, we're not going to do them. We know that because of third party impacts. And then my team goes, how are they in detailed plans right down to the nth degree as the programs come up for for work? And some of these lead times, what's lead time on a, a on the road return reservoir? When do you start planning for that? Yeah, so two years with a lead time to build detailed plans, right? And But we've already done a macro level budget. So there's some nuances here that makes mm -hmm. us not able to be compared to Fonterra, but to suggest that this is a wrong or a bad thing it, it is just a thing. And the, the, the best thing we can do is work as hard as we can, with our, which we do with our developers, with our contractors, having a forward program, working with um, third party stakeholders, iwi and, and so forth. In that sense, that meeting you were at last week, Councillor Mellor, is trying to have greater visibility of what's going on. So all these third party impacts that private organisations don't have to deal with are addressed as soon as we can, and that's where we can get some gains. So if we can build that relationship and keep driving that, we will get some gains and this will reduce. But we still can't control the third party. We can only, all we can do is receive that as data in and adapt accordingly. Okay, thank you. Um, Paula. Oh, just a quick one, kind of following up on that. I don't want to go down to the same level of detail, just to ask, um, um, because we've got the asset management plans too that are pertinent to this conversation and I understand the complexity about it. Um, Angela did say herself that it was a bit complicated to find some of the line items. It is, of course, because we're a complex business. But just tr I am um, also interested in tracking um, some of the deferrals over time, and it's a little bit difficult when in this format. So it's just around how we know. I noticed, for example, and I wasn't going to make an, any kind of big deal about this at this point because on its own it's not relevant, but there's a little bit of... Um, deferral around the renewals for the stadia and for the Claudelands, which might not matter this year, but it might matter if we continue to do that a little bit less, a little bit less over um, 15 years, and then we're in strife because we've got um, degraded buildings that haven't been sufficiently. And I know that sits in the asset management plans under Chris's team, but understanding the connection with what we're seeing here and as asset management plans, is there anything that can be done to make that a little bit clearer? We can certainly work on that, yes, and just make it, yeah, have a look at how some, what some of the explanations and what we're doing with some of those. But, I mean, and the main thing for some of those, mm -hmm. why they seem little amounts, but again, remembering that we, because we're so constrained on our budgets, like an extra $50,000 means we can do something slightly 
you know, a better pay or a bigger project, maybe next year or something like that. It, so it, it can, but it's having that governance <coughs> oversight <laughs> about where it's gone and where why it's gone and how long you're not doing something. And it might be sure. that you prefer n not to do anything at all over a period of time, but that's got to be an active governance decision, not an accidental one. So I need to understand how that tracks over time, and I'm still learning <coughs> how to look for that. Sure. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Paula. Uh, just a couple of things, uh, Tracy. Um, on the um, deferrals, the paragraph 44 with the deferral thing, there's a number of times we've used the word network, uh, and I found though that a little bit unhelpful. Uh, I don't know if it's a roading network or a stormwater network or a... So can we just be a bit clearer on that, please? Um, on page 18 in the risks and opportunities, <coughs> Uh, under uh, nearly at the bottom of that uh, table, there's unbudgeted costs to investigate cause and risk of slips. So that's new work that we're doing. What has, has that work started? Yes, it's it's been done. You're doing this? Yeah, it slips on the river walkway. Oh, okay. There's <laughs> a brief, briefing on it tomorrow, oh, and, okay. and all the implications of that. All right. So, so it's, an, it's engineering investigations into slips and effects on our land and the neighbouring people's land. Okay, so this is potentially a, this is like a thin end of the, that, well, it, the best we can hope for is there is no um, damage or no ongoing costs, but that's unlikely. Presumably this this could be um, the thin end of a, of a wedge, which... All will be revealed tomorrow in the briefing. Uh, we've got nine active slips at the moment on the river river <coughs> path. Um, we've had a extraordinary um, year of major weather events, mm. the wettest autumn since 1932, I've been told. Um, so we'll talk about that tomorrow and the legal implications of those as well. Okay. So that all right. So thank you. Um, just as a point of observation. Uh, uh, and me elected members might be may, may or may not be aware of it that our, our rates are tracking about 4.3% uh, ahead of last year, so that'll be the 3.8 plus growth. Um, if I'm reading it right, are our development levies dropping quite a bit from last year? Yes, quite a lot from last year. We had. Um yeah, it's just the nature of mm. we got quite a lot in the end at the back. And I appreciate the back end it's of really last year. humpy yeah. and lumpy and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So the last um, three months, I think it was at the end of the last financial year, we got quite a substantial amount in, um, and yeah, then I obviously that. it dropped yeah. off. Okay. So yeah. Okay. So this is as at May. Um, is is the whole torrent of money come in in June? No, I don't think there has been. No. no. Okay. So that's likely to be tracking substantially under last year's results. Yes. Okay. Um, and this one, I know we, this is the sort of thing, I know we set up budgets and then we approve them, you guys work the budget, but I, I, I regularly like looking, trying to identify trends by looking at what happened last year. Our personnel costs are up nearly 10, you know, 9.6 per cent on the last year, and I appreciate again you're the messenger only. Um, is this something we should be expecting? I mean, I know there's the, the zoo stuff. Yeah, so there's the zoo and the city safe. Um, the other thing that um, we don't have as many vacancies this year as what we did last year. Um, and the other thing, um, before last year we used to have, <coughs> excuse me, if we're bringing in consultants to replace a staff member or to do the work instead of a staff member, we used to show it in consultants. This year um, we include that as part of the personnel. So if it's someone specifically brought in to do a, an actual um, role, um, then and that now gets included in personnel, whereas last year um, it was caught um, down in the, or it was reported down in the consultants area. Okay, and sorry, I should know this, but can you, for the annual plan which we just approved, how much was our increase in personnel costs? And you may not remember this. Mm, no, I can't remember off the top of my head, sorry. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, Um, in the planning and environment, so page 32, 
uh, professional costs have dropped a lot. So this is a good, good news. Would that be because we were doing a lot of work last year in the district, so the year ended 16, there was a lot of district plan work, whereas this year that work is abated, is that? Yeah, so that's a classic example of where we were bringing in contractors um, to do a lot of the work that we um, needed to do last year and obviously don't need that so much this year. Okay. So hence the reason why the budget was, um, was altered to, to recognise that. Okay, thank you. Um, Just safety, uh, oh sorry, page 36. Revenue from activities. What is the revenue that we get from there? Is that dog fees? What other, th what other revenues do we get out of there? Yes, yeah, so the animal controls in that area. So all of the dog licensing fees and things like that. Uh, and there, is there more than that? Is that are this um, like uh, giving people food safety things? Is that all that sort of stuff too? That's all included in there, yeah, is it? Okay. A lot of regulatory. But this is not um, consenting revenue, is it? No. no. Okay, thank you. Uh, page 38. I think I know the answer to this. Um, revenue from activities last year was 1.4 million, it's now 91. That's solely because of pensioner housing, is it? Yes, that was the email that I sent out after you asked that question at the last meeting. It's pensioner housing. Yes. And that's all of that, OK. Oh, well, I asked that one before. Yes. <laughs> At least I'm consistent. consistent. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> and the gains and losses down the bottom there, that hoary great $7.4 million, is the loss on sale of the, the pension houses. Housing. OK, thank you. Uh, page 40, governance. Um, the professional costs. So that's sort of nearly at the bottom of the expenses. Last year it was 206,000. Currently it's uh, 685. Is that the cost of the? That's effectively the election cost, is it? Yep. So you've already asked me that, that question as well. Time. Yes. <laughs> Memory like a sieve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, personnel costs. Staff vacancies in the mayoral support services. To what do we? Um, there's a quarter of a million dollars saving there. So is this Andrew not not eating enough lunches or something? Um, so that's um, the mayoral support costs is where the mayoral office staff uh, sit. As you're aware, um, the uh, previous budget included a number of positions that the current mayor has decided not to fill. Um, and um, they'll be reassessed as part of the 10-year plan program in terms of uh, where the mayor is going. Um, we have identified there's probably the need for some additional staff in there, which um, the mayor flagged at a pre one of his chairs report to a council four or five council meetings ago that, that was still underway. Okay. So um, I, I am aware of a few staff being employed re oh, relatively recently. Uh, um, that, that reflect, there's about five positions. There's only um, effectively uh, two, two, one a bit. Yeah. Yep, in there at the moment. Yep, that's right. So this is a great news story. Well, no, Mayor underspending his budgets. I disagree with the Mayor. I think it's very important that a Mayor of this city, of this size and importance, fourth largest centre is adequately resourced. I applaud his um, being very cost conscious, uh, but I'm very supportive should he choose to uh, increase that staffing resource. Do you think there are situations where he's um, under-advised or poorly advised? To advise the Mayor, I have shared a point of view with him. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Um, again, the same thing also, administra administrative costs, that's um, 800,000 below budget, is that just as a consequence of, um, well, it's not using all the budget that is set by the higher, whatever it's called, the salaries commission or something? Is that a, a presumably administrative cost there is primarily councillor salaries and things like that, is it? No. Oh. No. Even no. though, even though it says council remuneration on area also. It's not the only, I mean, there's a, 
there's a huge list of, of different oh, okay. accounts and things that go into that that space. So does that include um, the liens and that and the big? Okay. Correct. Right. And, and council remuneration is in that pot, is it? Yes. Okay. Uh, Councillor, I also understand that there's some technical lines in terms of allocation of overhead resources, which is a, a technical accounting treatment that I don't uh, necessarily understand that's included in that, um, that figure there. So it's not pure savings in, in my layperson's non-bean counter uh, reckoning of variances. So there's no argument for bringing back councillor lunches? No. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll go we'll finish at eleven o'clock. Um, uh, just on page forty two, forty three, there's some stuff that about the Hamilton Garden sh sh stock expenditure, blah blah blah. Uh, I, I don't quite understand what it is, what they're saying. So what they're saying is obviously we've got higher revenue, but to, uh, to have that higher revenue, you need higher stock. Mm. Um, so you need some more things for them to buy. So because it gets split between the two, obviously you're seeing a higher revenue, but, but there will between be... Between the two? A, what do you mean the between the two? So between um, <coughs> revenue and one of the... Oh, it'll okay. be sitting in um, administrative costs. I'm picking. Um, so there'll obviously be an increase. So there's an overspend in there because obviously you have to go and buy all of the product and that goes through into that line. But then you're obviously spending it. So it means that your revenue's increased as well. So you obviously need the two together. So your gross profit has increased because your sales have gone up. Correct. And of course your cost of sales will go up. Yep. But you hopefully your sales go up by more than your cost of sales. And you go. should have a margin. Is that about right? That's right. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. And this is just an interesting one. Well, how, Chris, on page 46, Stormwater has no personnel expenses, and I don't understand why that is. <laughs> All robots, eh? There's what? There's no one living down in the property. No. <laughs> so we don't do anything. Um, they're, they're, they're accounted for in, a, um, uh, in a, um, another budget, so a um, support services budget. Oh, yep. Why do you do that? I mean, like stormwater is a core core function. I don't quite understand why you. So, um, look, it's just the way. And I think the same was with, um, or very much, it's almost the same in sewage yeah. I think the, and the, water supply. The main reason is that because we're a time cost business. Beg your we, pardon? We're a time cost business in the three waters, so we allocate. Allocate our time through uh, support. Um, you know. so. I can't understand that. <laughs> so, so basically, the, it's time, they're time sheeted. If they do work um, relating to stormwater or any other activities, they get coded. They're based on their time sheets, so that reflects for this month. There's been no time allocated to stormwater. But this is for the first for the first eleven years. Um, well, there Myra, were no, no one. I'm going to ask Myra to give the actual answer rather than something I made up. <laughs> Good effort, everyone, so far. Nothing's cut the mustard. <laughs> oh, sir, I can't say that. That's a colloquialism. Where all our personnel costs get charged to, and then they get um, time costed or transferred out to each activity based on the amount of hours that people have allocated to that activity. They don't get. They don't show through the personnel costs. They come up as, I think it's under the administrative costs, as a, as a time cost charge to that activity. So the recharge, yeah. So, re, uh, so, uh, so it's recharged out to where, who? So it's uh, to the four activities that oh. City Waters actually over, overview. So that will be through the water, wastewater, stormwater, and- uh, What's the value in doing that? What's the logic in doing that? That's to make sure that the cost of, of of people's time is allocated appropriately to the right activity. So you're saying that people like, An like Andrew and all the guys who, and, and yourself and everyone in there, you don't actually, you, you time cost on your um, timesheet, I spent four hours on sewage work today and four hours on stormwater work today. Mm. Okay, but then why, it, that, that would enable you to <laughs> so we have we have a team that obviously looks after four activities mm. and so there's not a team for stormwater and a team for wastewater mm. and a team for, for
for solid waste as such. So it's just a way of proportioning time against a particular activity. It, it's a particularly important in the water area uh, in terms of um, we, we're supposed to, and we do, and ensure that we only cover our costs for our commercial water metering. metering. So this also enables that that time is adequately and efficiently allocated to that activity as well. So it's a cost allocation process. So it just, it just helps ensure that costs end up in the right part. And some okay. of that will end up as capital costs as well, Myri, as well. So some of the projects they're working on will be capitalised, and so they won't end up in here as well. Okay. So it's a diverse business, and it goes to the right place for those So costs. the personnel costs aren't charged to the garden, say, then? They, they, are, they are in there in operating and maintenance costs or something, are they? Because that the, looks like the big figure, which would be the only thing that would be big enough to put your wages in. Uh, it would be under the administrative costs. Uh, under admin, is it? Yes. Um, we can, if you wanted to, it's just purely a reporting line and mm. how it happens to be done. It could, if you wanted to, from the long-term plan, it could be reflected as a personnel, as part of the... I mean, remembering on personnel, there's about um, nine or ten different accounts anyway. Yeah. Um, so we could um, re start reporting it through there if that was um, what you wanted. So those, so those personnel for the waters then isn't reflected in the overall personnel figure... In the PLs? Yes, it will be. So that, that oh. personnel at the beginning, um, well, because there's a support. So remembering I've got 200 odd cost centres, so yeah. there's a cost centre called Support Services, which captures at a personnel line, because um, that actually matches what we pay, um, but then it obviously gets um, recharged out at a different, basically in different um, cost codes. Okay, I'll talk to you the, the yep, after this. That's fine. Okay. All right. Um, are there any more questions on? The 10-year monitoring report. Can I, sorry, can I just, um, Angela, you were right. It was the 6th of April, um, and it was the 1.08 1. Um, 1. for that particular report. There was a report that came afterwards with another $800,000 um, on it afterwards. So um, there was two parts to it. So, yes, you were correct. Congratulations, Angela. I am off. Well, <laughs> that's great effort. How can you... <laughs> very... Yeah, well, just yeah, working hard. Um, okay, there's no more discussion. Any debate? Okay, I'll move the Finance uh, Committee receives the report. Can I have a seconder? Uh, James, those in favour, those against, carried. Thank you. All right, I now suggest we have a 10 minute break, come back at quarter past 11. If that's okay. Thank you.
Um, we're now moving on to uh, key project managing uh, monitoring report, page 62, item number seven. Yep, Do we have any? Uh, and David. Oh, sorry. sorry. Just take it as, take it as oh. read, as similar as to prior, prior meetings. Um, there's been no change in the risks um, since the last report of the committee meeting. But thank you. Uh, do we? Ha uh, Rob's moved. Do we have any questions? Just one. Just one. Chris, is that are they finally going to finish it? It says 30 June here. I know we're only a couple of days past that. Yeah. So one of the other issues is completing the signals or planning road. Yeah. So we've um, Kiwi Rail have been a bit elusive, but they've pinned down now for the 7th of July to do the work. Um, so we, I think Jason heard just this morning that they're still on for 7th of July. So that then uh, completes the signalisation. Um, and uh, we can remove the temporary traffic management there. So is that just, the only thing I need to check is planting. It might be that um, uh, we haven't finished all the planting. I just need to check that one. So is that completion on the 7th of July or starting? Because they did have a little digger Com there today. Completion should be. I went, woo, so I we, drove through. We've had dates before and they've come and gone. So okay, um, great. Uh, the mayor has helped me elevate it a little bit. So we've got a, we've got a date of the 7th of July and hopefully they'll stick to that. Thanks, Chris. Okay, David. Um, following that question, um, Chris, is there any truth to the rumour that you rang them up yesterday afternoon and said, for Christ's sake, I've got a meeting tomorrow to get the, de the digger down there and start it? <laughs> <laughs> is that the answer to our carryovers problem? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, um, what about, um, I, 
I'm not sure whether this is the right place to do it. That's one of the problems with these things being split up. <coughs> um, in this case, uh, usage figures the most later for that project, for that rail trail. So I'm just wondering how that'll affect the decision that we made the other day about where these things get discussed in the finance committee or the um, or this committee. Uh, are you not aware of that discussion? Uh, I am. That, that was more about our KPI reporting in the long-term plan, I think, rather okay. than. Okay, but the KPI wasn't isn't just finishing the project. There was a there was a business case for the project which included potential usage, didn't it? Yeah, but I think that would clearly go up through growth and infrastructure in, in my mind at okay. project level. Yep. All right. That's good to hear. Um, I've got a couple other questions, Mr Chair, um, relating to the two other um, orange flagged, amber flagged um, <coughs> items on page... 65. 65. Yep. Um, the... The, the timing of this is all wrong. It's got part of the um, report says that a further update will be provided to GNI committee on 20th of June. Now, I mean, I know it's the 4th of July now, so I'm not even sure why that's in there. It's sort of confusing about is this still amber flagged or is it actually now happened? <coughs> or, you know, it's quite a confusion when you get out of date reports like this. We're just conferring. Um, sorry, Councillor, we're, we're just checking. We, we think... Yeah, we, might have, we might have come to committing a little bit um, earlier than that, but yeah, we're just checking. It seems to me that with the decision we made, then while you're checking in GNI, that it should no longer be amber. Because because you've passed the next yeah. stage? I, I think it's um, amber because there's still funding decisions to make. So uh, we, we're, we're working with council to progress to a grade separation, but we don't have uh, construction funding approval. So I think that's uh, principally the reason it's amber. Well, it's, not really cl it's not clear at all why it's amber then. I thought... Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, so the point is well made. I think we could be better in our comments. On yeah, that and, and maybe when things do change from the writing of the report to the meeting, a verbal update is a matter of course in that, that area. Um, so that's <coughs> one. The next one was the uh, one underneath North City Road Urban Update. It says there um, delays in obtaining agreement with developers. Um, which risk the time frame. So can you explain that a bit more? You know, is someone refusing to sell us the land or wanting more than the market value for it? Or um, what, what's happening there that's slowing it up and what's the new time frames looking like? So, so that one, we've um, got really positive engagement with the developer. They've changed their program just based on economic <coughs> drivers. Um, so they've slowed up a bit, but it's tied up with um, some pretty uh, significant investments they're about to make in the North City area in relation to supermarkets and things like that. They've uh, awarded the construction contracts, but um, they've made a commercial decision not to start um, during winter. Um, so it's, a, it's still an ongoing negotiation that we're having with them to purchase HCC components, and it's going well. But I think it's something that we will um, be resolving in this new financial year so it's, it's amber simply because of the time frame. It's not amber because um, there's financial challenges or anything like that at this stage. But uh, take it from me, we've, it's a really um, positive engagement with, okay. the, with the developers out there. Well, again, the report doesn't say that to me, Andrew. It yep. says um, that there's a problem with dealing with the developers. That's mm. how I'm, I'm reading yep. it. Yep. And you're saying something different, when I can quite understand that, but this is not how I read it. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I absolutely agree. And look, we can, we can improve the commentary uh, in this report going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thanks, Dave. Um, I think Rob had previously moved this. 
Okay, I'll second it. Oh, sorry, is there any further questions? Okay, uh, Pasco and Mallet, those in favour, those against, carried, thank you. Okay, item eight, single year community grants, page 67. Can I just, um, <clears throat> at the onset of this report, um, and we, I think we all understand this, that, that this report is coming to us as a matter of information. Uh, we, have, we have delegated the process for awarding or not awarding grants to this, com the, uh, this committee. Um, so that's not the purpose for this report coming here. Now I know uh, Dave's got some, or Dave will tell you what his questions are about, concerns, but um, please, we are outside the uh, terms of reference of this committee if we start saying why did they get it instead of someone else getting it, okay? If we can all hopefully accept that. All right, uh, Andy. Sure, Councillors, uh, I trust you've read the report. Uh, here to answer any questions and just confirm what uh, Councillor Gary just said in terms of the allocation committee have been given delegate authority to uh, make the decisions. And uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Ah, surprisingly, there's a Dave McPherson one who asked a question. <laughs> Where you go, Dave? Thanks. Andy, first thing on the process, if that's the case, why did you hold up releasing this information? Because it's not, it's in public and it's not up to this committee to approve or disapprove? Uh, I'm not sure how it's long, it's been waiting, but at least three weeks since this was written. Uh, following process, I guess, I'm happy to, if the councillors preferred us to just release it onto our website and send emails, we could do that. But traditionally we've come to a finance report because there is money involved and so we've just followed that process <coughs> this year again. I just think that, uh, I mean, if, if a group has been given delegated authority to make a decision and you've got community groups out there which are hanging out for the results, and I know some have been told verbally, but um, why don't you just tell them? And, oh, and sorry, um, sorry, I misread the question there. So in terms of the, the process with an individual applicant, they would have been notified within a couple of days of the allocation committee okay. sitting. They would have received a contract. Uh, they, most of them would have been paid by now. Okay. So in terms of the individual um, agreement with applicants, that's all sorted uh, within the six week time period of applications closing. But in terms of the full report for councillors, we've traditionally collated that and come to a finance committee. Well, I'd just suggest it'd be pointless sort of hanging out, hanging by with the, the public announcement, then, but that's, it's not yeah. a big issue then, the way you've explained it now. Um, the next point though, I think perhaps is, we often get complaints about from certain sectors of the community and, and council sometimes, not that I'm looking at the chair particularly here, but about the amount of money we give out to community organisations. Has there ever been a measurement of the value the city gets for grants such as these? Um, <coughs> you know, like whenever we have a test match here we get these reports that it's brought in X number of dollars to the city's economy or the region's economy, that sort of thing? Difficult to uh, fully measure, but I guess the measure that we've used in number 17 is a little bit of the money that we give versus the total project cost, yeah. uh, which shows, I guess, the contribution that council was making to an overall picture. But that doesn't talk through, um, you know, economic the, benefit. The, the, yeah, yeah, the flow. The next step. <coughs> <coughs> I mean, I have seen figures done like that. For instance, Massey University's done some work in that area in the past. I think Waikato may have as well. Some sectors, even School of Management, are wondering whether, at some stage, it might be worth a small project of research to actually uh, say, say what's the benefit. Uh, Mark. Yeah, the likes of Well Trust, they're already down that track. And they're quite happy to share that data around. There's a lot of talk about collusion and uh, not collusion, bad word, but you know, cooperation and that sort of field. So that works already there for us to tack onto. I think it, I think it'd be well worth it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Everyone has to prove their worth in some way or another, and this mm. is, would be a good way of helping in this area. So, um, so Mr. Dave, Chairman, I'll I'll undertake. Oh. Um, I think uh, Councillor Mark's got a good suggestion. Um, there is a funders group that meets um, of all the philanthropic funders, I think they've probably all got that sort of information. So what, I'll get Andy to contact them and 
and just see what information we can gather at you know re a relatively low cost or effort, um, and then if we need any further information about what our grants are doing, then we can always um, bring some information back to councillors on uh, what effort would be needed to actually extrapolate that. Yep. Um, Excuse me, Dave, can I just uh, just sorry. tease this out a little bit? <clears throat> you talked about the, the benefit of rugby m matches or cricket games and whatnot, and, that, and that's normally, I think, uh, formulated on days spent in hotels, booze drunk and restaurants and things like that. In this, so for example, the first one is asthma and respir respiratory uh, services, Waikato. What would you expect to come back from that? That, that oh, five that, people are now no, able to go to work that couldn't go to work because they are off asthma or something like that? Is well, that what you're yeah, saying? You, you, you might have some <coughs> factors like that. Obviously, there'd be some of them would be different factors. Some of them involve spending in the community, just like the other ones, mm. um, potentially. Some of them involve money saved because if it was um, an organisation like the council or the DHB in the case that you're talking about because they, they don't have to, the service is being provided <coughs> voluntarily or semi-voluntarily and it's, it's saving X number of, you know, you would have had to employ a, a GP for some of that work or whatever. There's a whole lot of different factors that could be there, many of which would be different from your rugby thing. I'm, that was I only talking mm. about the final result. But there's certainly, um, uh, as Mark says, work that's been done in that area to show economic benefits of grants like this. Okay, I'm just trying to get some sort of real cl clarity because it's one of those things that, um, A, you're relying on uh, uh, very subjective measurements, you know, um, well-being and things, which, you know, are, are important, but they're very difficult to quantify at times, um, and the value of a person, you know, well, you, and, 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 you know, $5,000 for asthma and res respiratory services, who I know I know very little about, but that's a won't be a big part of their funding. So to say that our $5,000... Um, no, I'm, causes, talk, I'm, yeah. talking, I'm not talking about individual <coughs> groups necessarily, you'd have to do some sort of sample. Yeah. And I'm talking about the 292,000 we've put in. What is that leverage in terms of benefit for the community? And I guess it's your speech or your comments just then are exactly why I think it would be handy to have a little piece of work here just to, mm. is it worth it, you know, from our point of view? I think it is. I, I guess there's two questions. Uh, just what, what precisely are you asking for? And secondly, could you ever get an objective, accurate measure. Some could say the same about economic benefits from rugby matches. Mm. See, in fact, some do say the same. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, in fact, I seem to recall you saying the same about the economic mm. benefit of the stadium. Yeah. Um, Still do. <laughs> yeah, and Claudlands for that matter. So, um, but there are nevertheless measurements developed uh, based on a series of factors which we measure and. You know, we could argue about that, whether they're the right ones mm. or they're treated the right way, but at least there's something try empirical being attempted. OK, and, thank you. Yeah, that's where I'm coming from. I had some questions which related... All the Sorry, other just, just... And, that, and that's the sort of stuff you were talking about, Chris? OK, thank you. Uh, Lance. As long as Lance, Lance. beg your pardon. I always call you Chris. I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> you fight, white folk all look the same. <laughs> OK. Um, the, one of the figures we used to see, Andy, when we got reports like this was how much had been applied for and how much was successful. We don't see that in here because it was quite instructive to us when there were debates about whether the quantum of the overall figure was right. We were told, well, in actual fact, there was 700,000 applied for and we gave 200,000 or whatever like that. So we could see that um, we weren't uh, meeting what the community was describing as a need. Yeah. Um, so is it possible to have uh, that? Just at the top of the attachment. Uh, so 596,611 was applied for. Yeah. Um, but that... Did that include the unsuccessful applicants? Oh, OK, so I, I took that to just include oh, these no, ones. Sorry, so that was that was yeah. the full ask? OK, or, yeah. all right. So we gave a bit less than, about half of uh, what was... Yeah. OK. Um, the, another one in here is um, some of these groups are Waikato groups, 
do we ever check that they are also applying to other councils at all? Is that a question we ask uh, for activities? If there are a group that I know, the Waikato Filipino Association, um, by way of example, on the last page got a grant, which is I'm glad they did. Um, but do we ever <coughs> ask them, well, are you also applying to Waipa and Waikato for, for a share of... We, uh, we don't ask for a specific other territorial authorities that people are applying for. We do ask, uh, in terms of a project, who else they're applying for, or what the, the budget should look like in terms of where they're thinking that they'll get their money. Uh, from a, a Hamilton pers perspective, we're incredibly uh, sure that we're only funding things that occur within Hamilton. So for a regional organisation, we, we make sure that it's drilled down, that we're not funding things that are happening outside of the city, sure. but we don't ask that specific question around other councils. Fair enough. Um, the last question I had related to this, quite a number, and I count up 17 groups that are working in the health area. Um, have we ever had a discussion with the DHB um, who do give out, um, not grants, but contracts to community organisations and NGOs, they call them, um, working in the health area. Do we ever check that um, we're not being used as a de facto health funder, or our fund is not being used? I've I've not had that specific uh, conversation with the DHB, and I'm, I'm happy to talk with some of our colleagues and, and to ensure that. Looking at the individual applications and looking at the the financial sheets and the bud, you know, the bottom lines. Uh, any time that it looks like that council funding is not needed. It's not so much not needed as that yeah. we're, they're coming to us rather than asking the DHB. So it's needed, but you know, are we the right place to fund it is the sort of where I'm coming, my question's coming from. Uh, I'd have to drill into each of those applications, but I'd be pretty sure that we are not the only philanthropic fund that those groups are applying to. So there is a larger conversation, I guess, there in terms yeah. of the size of contracts versus the outcomes that are needed to be delivered for the community. And whether yeah. the sort of vote health nationwide or in the Hamilton is getting it on the cheap because the council's willing to fund some of that. Uh, um, I can follow up with colleagues yeah. at the DHB around some of that. Yeah, just interested in that. Thanks. Thank you, Mr Chief. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Paula. To just finish his... I'm happy to let Mark finish his... Oh, questions. sorry. No, that's fine. So, sorry, who's talking now? But I am next after Mark, if that's okay. be possible. Um, just, yeah, carrying on from what Dave said, um, the opportunities are pretty huge for um, uh, cooperation with the other funding bodies along that line. Because I noticed that, I mean, this could be... Uh, very much looking at every other grants, you know, it's the same list of the same people. Um, and I know we found on the trust that working with the other funders actually got much better bang for the buck along those lines. Are we, how, how close in those discussions are we in those, Andy? Or? We're incredibly close. The philanthropic sector within Hamilton is one of the tighter around the country, so we okay. sit regularly with the other funding uh, advisors as well as with the other chief funding chief executives. and. Right. So we ensure that the conversation is happening. Where there's regular conversations of a particular group uh, speaking with everybody around the table rather than just going through the process of right. individual applications. We, uh, we've got a review of the community assistance policy coming up and one of the conversation points really has been with the other funders in terms of where we fit within the network of funds that are happening in the city, because yeah. we all do slightly different things and that creates a, uh, a really cohesive funding environment for our community groups. Yeah. So we are, we are tight in those conversations. Yeah. And we're pretty tiny comparatively anyway, aren't we, compared to those other guys? But yes. Um, because um, um, is there an opportunity to link up our grants round with others and to basically all sit at the same table to get it that close down the track? Because I reckon that would be a fantastic <laughs> idea because then we could all work from our own terms of reference. The challenge with that is um, the Well Energy Trust barriers is um, boundaries are quite different from Hamilton City, which mm. are quite different from Trust Wakato, which are quite different from our COGS. Mm. So each uh, funder has their own geographic space. 
there are conversations around how do we make our application forms um, talk to each other a little bit better. And yeah. So there is work in the systems of making sure that it's uh, not double the workload for our community groups, but then also that our funders are talking to each other. One of the things that is often talked about around the philanthropic sector is how do we avoid duplication and how do we avoid mm. uh, you know, funding the same things. And so those conversations are... They're very open in terms of the conversations. Yeah, I, I get your point about the differences. Yeah. I'm just thinking that, you know, look, these are the same names that you see on all the other funding things. So obviously they're all pushing the right buttons. Um, would it be more effective to have them all sitting in the same room, um, uh, like in a room like this, turning up saying, listen, we want to run a big kids festival in the lake? And the council would say, yep, yeah, that's more us than you guys. We'll put in money for that, etc." And it just saves them a hell of a lot as well. So. I can uh, race that with the, the funders network and give it a crack. And see what uh, it there feels like. There's a few logistical challenges there, yeah. um, but yeah. we can have that conversation, and I'll let you know how it yeah, cool. goes. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks Paula. Thank you, um, Chairman Gary. Um, just uh, just uh, to preface this, I, Philip and I sat on this round, so it was my first first. Go. So I had fresh eyes at looking at how the process went, which I think is useful. We had some conversation, didn't we, at the end of the day and a half, and it did take a day and a half, full day and a half, long days, to try and get through them all. But um, some questions, and then I just might make a comment since it's happened to be with others. Um, when would... Uh, oh, two things. I thought it would be useful, because hearing the conversation of Dave and Mark, if you would let people know who was sitting around the table with me and Philip. That's the first question. I've got others. Say that again. Because uh, let, uh, if we could, if uh, it could be shared with council, who sat around the decision making table with Philip and I? Because they were the oh. other sectors were there, right? Can you remember? Uh, I, I, I can remember. No, I just uh, we've traditionally had that not as public oh. um, open, just to save them from being uh, lobbied. Okay. So well, in terms tell, of, tell who they represented. Uh, so we had, uh, in terms of organisations, we had Creative Waikato and Community Waikato, um, Link Trust, uh, Te Wananga o Aotearoa and Red Cross. Okay, so just I'm just um, that, that's. Good information for council. Question, yeah, good. just good information for council to understand there was a spread mm. of, um, con of um, assessors. Is that a word? Mm. Assessors who did represent the various different sectors and I, quite knowledgeable. I can email the the names to elected oh, members. I, if, I don't know if, if it's like. necessary as long as you understand that there were key people from each of those yeah. those, and that doesn't um, stay the same every year. But there's a spread of those types. Um, <clears throat> Just tell me, because we did talk about it at the end of the day, especially as a new assessor, I thought about some of the criteria. We had conversation on day two about that. When would, um, for council's information, when would or could and ha um, a review of the criteria for that fund be conducted? When would you normally expect that to happen? Uh, so uh, I'm hopeful to get in front of uh, our brief in a briefing in August to talk about our community assistance policy, of which we would look at the criteria and guidelines of, of each of the funds that are... Sorry, what date when did uh, you do that? I haven't been confirmed, but hopefully 10th of August. August? Because <laughs> I think that's, that's a fairly vital piece of um, information for councillors because criteria does drive process quite often. <coughs> At least that's what I found being part of it. I wonder also if we can please, can we have a breakdown of the um, projects from a sector and project type doesn't you don't have to identify them back to the individual organizations but i did note some trends and dave made some, dave has made some pertinent comments around health sector um, there were also a number of um, applications from the migrant communities and there were a few other sectors represented mental health was another um, sector that um, I recall as having a number of applications. Um, so I think that would be useful information. I don't know whether you're bringing it to the review of the criteria, but to provide that, could we please? Um, and I'd like to also bring, if we could please, um, trends in what types of projects are getting funded and what are, what are not quite getting there, because that will also help drive the review of the criteria. I'll just make one observation to finish, and uh, you might be able to respond to it, is that we noted that we were unable to provide um, funding 
um, to some um, groups and organisations based on the quality of information provided in their application or their, or their ability to, to get the application to be together and I wonder what we can do to assist them because actually some of the activities sitting behind the application were probably quite worthy but we were unable to go there, they just didn't have the information we required. Um, so, you know, I'd like to think that we give everyone a fair share uh, of an opportunity by enabling them to put the best kind of information forward. Um, and just a flag, just some personal flag, councillors, so we're getting um, increasing um, pressure on this fund because we, you know, we're getting small events coming through there now because we don't have uh, an events budget except for the bigger events. Uh, which we're not going to get an update on at some point soon. Um, so just note that because it's not a lot of money and we're always leaving many groups behind as a consequence of which <coughs> there are some activities and events that just simply will not occur. So we need to, in the LTP, consider the quantum. Have we got it right? Have we understood what we should be involved in and what, what we don't need to be involved in? Um, just make those comments. Thank you. David. Sorry, I didn't have one question. I missed before. Um, it, about four or five years ago, in her infinite wisdom, the previous Mayor of Council supported rolling together funds for small community events, for the environment, I think for the arts, I'm not sure mm -hmm. about that one, and, and the general community grants, all into one thing. Has there been an analysis of um, which groups, it sort of follows Paul's question, which groups, which type of groups are getting grants that would normally have gone to those different ones? We haven't fully done that, but I can provide that for the briefing that we go to. One of the uh, consequences of that rolling up all together was that our multi-year grant or our, um, our three-year grants is larger than it used to be under the, the old um, breakup. So we, uh, we had about $500,000 worth of single year grants going out to those different sectors. We now only have the 292. So everything would have been <coughs> decreased, but I can definitely uh, pull, but since we're on Smarty Grants, I can pull all that data and provide it at the briefing. I do recall the previous mayor saying during debate, and I note that staff also in their infinite wisdom agreed with that rolling together of all the funds. Um, but uh, the previous mayor did it agree that there would be an analysis done of what's happened because there was a concern and I raised it in, in relation to the environment grants that they would that that would, group would have uh, find it hard pressed to or that sector would find it hard pressed to get grants when up against some very needy ordinary community organizations if you like so uh, my question then goes on to that area Forty thousand dollars was the annual amount being given for environment, small environmental grants in the city. In here, there's only seven thousand dollars given to that, and I note that I think I heard you right. There was no one from the environment sector on your group. Um, uh, so my question is: Did you promote this within the environment sector? Because the two groups that got it were pretty hardy, much hardy annuals. The two groups who did get environment grants. And if, Dave, uh, was there was there, Dave, was there any thought to having someone from the environment sector on your group? So you, you're just getting a little close to um, why wasn't this? Why didn't these people get the money when someone else got the money? No, no, it's sectors. Yep. sectors. I'm yep. I'm asking why when forty thousand no, dollars was no, given from that sector and there are only seven granted this time. What's happened mm. and what's been me measured? So in, in answer to a few of those questions, uh, yes, we promoted uh, quite heavily. We used our networks through the uh, Environment Centre for them to promote in their weekly um, electronic newsletters, and we had lots of conversations with them as an organisation who are able to umbrella all other organisations and are able to kind of work at that grassroots level. So we did promote heavily. We didn't receive a lot of environmental uh, applications, to be fair, and we funded a fairly high proportion of what we received. Only two. Uh, yeah. Yes. So, if the, uh, so then there's a follow-up question. If you funded through the Environment Centre, which actually was a group that got a grant, 
what do they do on your behalf in terms of promoting it? It's just a, um, immediately occurs to me there, and I, it's not, no, I'm not questioning their grant at all. Uh, I'm, I'm saying, should we not be going to our? We used uh, to have our own environment um, list of groups that we could. And we absolutely uh, through through went through all of our distribution lists as well. We did media releases. We went off Facebook. So we did a, a fairly. Uh, strong push as we do traditionally uh, and we didn't sit in a situation where we had too much money to give and not enough applications so that's uh, a reality of the small grant. Uh, I will do that analysis for you in terms of uh, those sector stuff. I do know that one of the changes over the last few years is that we as a council have a, a waste mineralisation fund now and so that is a, another $50,000 that picks up uh, a, a lot of our smaller environmental groups and so and there is work that staff are doing in terms of some of the restoration stuff which doesn't need <coughs> the funding in the same way as uh, some of our other groups because they don't have the overheads. And this grant has traditionally been used for administration and operating costs. So there is a, a niche, I guess, to there that some environmental groups don't hit. We have traditionally funded a few schools and some of their environmental stuff. And with a income level of $750,000, uh, that has excluded some of our schools from the work that they've been able to do. Uh, and so there has been a, a little bit of a change in some of that environment. Uh, in terms of our allocation committee, one of our representatives who comes from Community Wākato has a really strong environmental sector background. And so when we looked at uh, who was going to sit on our allocation committee, that was a consideration and that box got ticked by the one individual rather than needing to uh, w w looking at who we had applied. Uh, we couldn't find somebody better for that. You've got a, someone with multi-talented person, a, a gay whale sort of thing. <coughs> OK, thank you. Uh, I've just got one governance question. Um, the, these groups here, it's a few in there. Uh, these groups here, um, most of us will know people involved. Um, and like I, I personally used to be involved with, well, my daughter used to be involved with writing to the tape, to say well, she's not anymore. And I always used to say, I'm... Um, that I've got some degree of conflict. Do, I mean, do, do uh, just perhaps members might like to be told what would constitute a conflict of interest in this situation? <coughs> yeah, no, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Conflict doesn't exist, but it's there. So the, the, the mere fact that all we're doing, okay, all right, so that probably answers it, okay. All right, and uh, any further questions? Pardon? Oh, sorry, Martin, I didn't really like, didn't see your name there. Talk away. Thank you. Uh, look, I think overall this process... Uh, Hang on, we'll get a move you're right. Do you want to move oh, sorry, I, so your name was down I'm there for I'm happy to move sorry. it, and whatever you tell me what I'm... Uh, you want to be happy to move? Right, yes. I'll second. <clears throat> this is We're a huge debate, debate right? about receiving a report. Um, no, I, I think if I could, Having sat on this uh, with Philip Young in previous years as the uh, chair and deputy chair of the very powerful and august community forum subcommittee. Um, uh, we, um, I have to say I want to compliment the external um, reps on that panel and I think they brought huge um, heft and, and, and our role was very much, if you like, just to be in the room to see a process is working correctly and all members of that panel at the point at which they were on some governance board of any of the groups stepped out of the room, obviously straight away, which we, Philip and I, did in our cases on a couple of occasions. Uh, I think um, Dave does raise a good point, and, and obviously I'm looking forward to, I see we've got, uh, Angela's just sent me the, uh, the, the breakdown with regard to the three-year grants, as I understand. I think it'd be good just to get a bit of a a summary of how things have been tracking over the last uh, three years in the, in the single year grants. I think there is merit, however, in having kind of a, a larger pool because then you can get a, a broader um, flavour. But it would be good to, in my view, note where the money is is going. And I think possibly um, I don't want to revisit this because uh, I want to keep this quantum in terms of the long term plan. I think it it has. Uh, even though some of these amounts may seem quite small amounts, it has a maximum impact in terms of assisting a whole lot of excellent volunteers. Uh, 
For example, however, we have um, a multi-year grant separate to this that goes off to the University of Waikato for their uh, Performing Arts Centre. Uh, that contract's coming up next year. We might want to have a really hard discussion about whether that amount goes into that, you know, what, what quantum, what uh, tangible difference does it make now going in there, and that's where we need a hard discussion. For example, when we're giving these multi-year grants as to the impact it is in terms of those particular groups or whether that actually that quantum comes back into this area or whatever. And I, I do have, uh, have a, a, an open mind. I respect that this comes to this committee because of the financial aspect, but obviously some of this discussion I think sits obviously in Paula's committee or, or in, a, in a workshop area. But I think conceptually this is a very, very good um, allocation of a quantum of money that I believe uh, goes way, way beyond an individual, say, 1,500 or 5,000 in terms of the impact that it has and the community good that it actually personally yields. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further debate? I'll put the motion that the report be received. Those in favour, those against, carried. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item nine. And there are two items which are very similar, but we'll do them separately. Uh, the lease of Spark on the Claudelands, page 73. Nicholas. Deal. Um, these are existing telecommunication facilities located on council property. They've had leases in place for some years. Uh, those leases are expiring uh, this year, and these are new lease arrangements to um, formalise those facilities. Happy to take any questions. Dave. <coughs> Thanks. Sorry. Uh, look, I realise these are historical, and they're originally with Telecom, who changed their name, and so now they're with Spark. But um, if a new provider, Vodafone, Two Degrees, or whatever, came to us and said, we want to put a bit of utility on Claudelands or anywhere like these, is that just a matter of course that we have to do that or that we will do that? How does that work uh, now that it's a competitive field? Yes. The, the short answer is no, we don't have to. Um, we, they, can, they can locate facilities within the um, roading corridor as of right, as yeah. that was a, a relatively recent change to the Tele Telecommunications Act. But in terms of locating facilities on council-owned land, then we have the absolute <coughs> right to approve or, or decline that um, application. Do we have a policy in that area that says if Vodafone comes to us, they go through the same process Spark has done, or how does that work? Yeah, we, we don't have a formal process around this, but um, typically all of these leases would come to Council for approval. Um, uh, generally speaking, it's not a, um, a financial threshold they have to cross, but it is definitely a, a term. So they, they exceed five years and therefore staff don't have the delegation to approve them. But I think in terms of, um, I, I'm not sure if you're wondering whether or not we'd end up with three of these things for three different um, providers sitting right next to each other on the same site. I mean, obviously yeah, we would, we'd have to consider that fairly carefully. But they, they could come to us. Oh, they could, and yeah. Which, if they did come to us, it would come to us? Yes, yeah? it would. Yeah. OK, thanks. OK, I'll move. Uh, sorry, any further questions or debate? Oh, sorry, Rob. Yeah, uh, just a question on, and it relates to both reports. Um, are we charging Spark the, exactly the same uh, rent as Spark would be likely to be charged if they were if they had the tower if they had the the utilities on private land? Uh, yes, the, um, the the rental is determined by um, uh, an independent registered valuer um, who takes into account the the relative cost of these facilities right across the the country. Okay. Okay. So there's no discount because it's no, on council no, land. No, no, definitely or, not. Okay. And what's been the increase in the rent? To say that the rent going forward is nine thousand yep. and eleven thousand. Do you know what the previous I, rents I do. were? So in terms of Claudelands, the rent has gone up uh, two thousand five hundred from six thousand four hundred thirty-seven. So that's a forty percent increase on that particular site. Um, I regret to say the same can't be said of Beetham Park. Um, the rent is going up um, a mere 339 from 10,661, so that's a 3.1% increase. 
Okay, and and is three years? Uh, there's a three-year time period between uh, market reviews on rental. Yes. Is that is that quite normal for that that industry? I, I, yes. I understand some leases now are down to 18 months. Yes. Not not leases of this type no. that I'm aware of, but no, this is consistent with the, the national approach. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okie dokie. Uh, I'll move. Is there a second? It. Uh, Mallet, McPherson, those, uh, any debate? Those in favour, those against, carried. Okay, we'll move over to the next one, which is item, where's the item number? Item 10, page 76. Second verse, same as the first. Yeah, ditto, really, is all <laughs> I've got to say there. Would you like to ask the same questions? <laughs> you can... <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, I'll move. <coughs> Mallet, McPherson, those in favour, those against. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we now move into the pink. Uh, I will I have to say something somewhere, don't I? Where will I do it? Oh, here it is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I shall move that we move into uh, public excluded. Uh, Mallet, Casson, any debate? Those in favour, those against?